welcome to the Strategy and Leadership Podcast, the podcast that brings you practical advice, lessons, and stories from senior leaders and thought leaders from around the world. The Strategy and Leadership Podcast is brought to you by SME Strategy, working with organizations around the world to create and implement their strategic plans. To learn more, visit smestrategy.net. And now, your host, Anthony Taylor. Hey there, thanks for joining us on today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Today, I get to interview Will Robinson, who is the CEO at Encapture. Uh, it's really fun hearing about his four-year journey as CEO um, in a really uh, exciting place in emerging technology, uh, entering a business as they transform, so digital transformation in a whole new space. For somebody who's only been working as a CEO for a couple of years, tons of really great experience, actionable takeaways. Sounds like he's building a really great organization there. So I really hope you enjoy today's uh, podcast, today's interview. Be sure to check out in capture uh, when you got some time. And if you find Will Robinson, make sure it's the one with red hair and he's the guy to talk to. So thanks for being here. I appreciate you and I will see you in the interview. All right. Talk to you soon. How's it going, folks? Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My guest is Will Robinson, who is the CEO at InCapture. Will, what's happening today? Anthony, how's it going? Thanks for having me on. I'm stoked to chat. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about what Encapture does, who you are, and then I'll ask some questions. Yeah, that sounds great. So Encapture is a software company. Uh, we help banks process loan documents. That's kind of the high level 30,000 foot answer that my grandmother gets whenever she asks me what we do. Uh, I guess digging down in the covers, we use uh, machine learning, which is a form of artificial intelligence to extract data out of documents, identify the doc types, and really just eliminate a lot of the manual data entry and the stare and compare processes that happen um, inside these banks. So um, if you've ever applied for a mortgage before, you know, you've had a loan officer maybe ask you for a copy of your driver's license, a couple of years tax returns, a bank statement, and uh, we can read through all those, calculate your income, get all that data in the right system and make the process go a lot faster. Wait, and how did you decide to start this company? Yeah, it's a funny it's a funny story. The company's actually 25 years old, which if you look at me, you realize I have not been here the whole time. But uh, we were kind of doing something different. And I joined about four years ago as part of a growth equity investment that the company received. And we uh, transitioned from kind of a legacy business model that was more professional services focused into kind of a more pure play SaaS uh, software business model. So it's been a big journey. Um, I have a background in uh, financial services and in in tech. So um, it's been a lot of fun, but this is my first CEO gig. So a lot of learning as well. Awesome. So let's let's start there. What had, you know, going through this process, shifting kind of the nature of your role and nature of the job, what's it been like, you know, transitioning into the CEO seat? What's your first uh, first experience like? Yeah, you know, it's a roller coaster. Uh, there's definitely, you know, highs and lows. And I think part of being successful in this role and any really manager role is is being able to embrace that and figure out a way to uh, not let it completely consume you. Uh, I was talking last week with a very successful CEO founder who's, who, who's uh, a couple decades ahead of me in the journey. And he was just talking about how the biggest thing he's learned in his 30 years is uh, navigating the roller coaster of emotions, of success and failure, um, and you know, making sure that uh, as a leader, you're able to kind of show up every day with a level of energy and consistency and focus that's required for the job because it's a it's a unique role and it gets glamorized a lot and it's a cool role and I love being able to do it but you have to have a, a very specific mindset I think to make it and I've been here about uh, about four years I feel like I've seen most everything at this point uh, or it feels like that. <laughs> uh, but it, it's been a great journey. That's awesome. Well, I think it's a cool situation that you've been in, at least from you know what you've shared and what I can research online, being kind of put into the organization, especially if it's a 25 year old organization that's been doing things a certain way. Now, you know, through, through the investment, through the growth, finding somebody that has the right mindset to win in that. And it's from the beginning of our conversation, it kind of felt like, you know, we have like a post game conference where you're like, oh yeah, how'd you do today? Yeah. We, you know, we, we four check back, checked it, all the stuff. And it kind of gives me that like, Hey, like we, it's a post game presser for a CEO, but it really sounds like you're, in it. You're in the game. You're really enjoying the game. And uh, I would bet it's probably in a in a 
area domain technology that you like. So I guess my question is, how have how's the experience been building the team to move forward with this new technology, new innovation and the transformation of the business? Yeah, it's been a it's been a huge overhaul. I mean, I think it's the short answer. And, uh, you know, that's what I say to other leaders. If you're trying to do something big and different from what's been done, you're probably going to have to start with a new team. Um, it required, you know, first you have to start with a vision of where are we going? And I think that was a big thing for us as we had been going a, down a different path for 20 years. And now we're kind of doing a, not really a 180, but but a huge pivot uh, and, and, and a push into kind of a different direction. And, um, you know, getting people excited about that, that, that have been around for a while uh, is really important. Uh, making sure that you have the right people to do that. And um, a lot of times, you know, I, I, to use a sports analogy, if you're, you know, the new head coach of, let's just say a football team and, uh, you know, you, the team has been sub, uh, has not been performing well over the last several years, you know, you're probably not going to keep the old coaching staff. Uh, you're probably going to bring in your own staff that understand your system, understand your culture, can help you reset. And, you know, you hope to, you hope to take the players that have been there and, and get them bought in. Um, some will make it, some won't. Um, but you really got to bring in fresh players, fresh talent that can really buy into the culture and buy into the vision. And so there's a lot of similarities there. And, uh, you know, it's been a journey. There's, there've been people that I think pretty quickly I recognize would not be a good fit for us going forward. Um, but there were unfortunately people, and this was the hardest people that were really good at their jobs, um, and, and really probably important contributors to the, to the company. But as we really started down this new path and we started getting momentum and things got busy, they were not um, either willing or or able to really buy in and kind of roll with that. Um, you know, change is hard. Uh, change requires flexibility and kind of a growth mindset. And I had a few folks that I would have loved to continue working here, but they they ended up opting out themselves. They said, "Hey, look, this is just too much. I can't do it. I don't know how to do it." Um, and that was hard to see. But ultimately, on the backside of that, we're a much stronger organization, and we're able to move a lot quicker and be, I think ultimately be more successful. Yeah. Uh, what was the process that you went through? And I ask, you know, selfishly because, you know, we lead strategic planning processes. We facilitate those types of conversations where the shift needs to be made and to make sure everybody's on the same page, not always, uh, you know, coming after a, an investment or, you know, significant change like that. But what was the process that your team, so call it not necessarily your executive team, but the people that you were working with went through to not only uh, obviously the acquisition or investment, shift the aim and then put all of those steps in place. Can you walk me through it without giving away any kind of secret sauce? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I try to keep stuff really simple. And I think to be an effective leader, the more complex the situation, the simpler you need to keep it for everybody. Uh, simplicity, is hard to get to, uh, but it does allow folks to focus and rally around the most important things that are really going to move the needle. So as a leader, it's important. And one thing we've learned is it's really important to keep it simple. Don't try to do everything at once. We completely overhauled this company. And, and so sometimes people say, hey, are you the founder of the company? Uh, I, I would say no. Uh, the short answer is no. But the long answer is if you look at what we're doing now and where we are and who we are versus where we were four years ago, it's a brand new company. And so, um, but we didn't get there in like, that was not like a three month, six month process. That was a two, two and a half year process of changing things out and being intentional and kind of letting the, especially the folks that I wanted to, that wanted to stick around and I wanted to keep around, not overwhelm them with too much. So uh, we kept the vision, you know, I think, first of all, you have to keep the vision consistent because as soon as the vision starts changing, I think you lose a lot of uh, trust from folks. Um, and then laying out a path and a plan where probably the first three, four, five steps, you know, were me pushing, saying, hey, guys, this is what we're going to do different. This is what we're going to do different because this is the vision that we're going after. After that, though, you start hopefully engaging your team members to start pushing alongside you, whether that's new people you're bringing in or, you know, even existing folks that know what's going on. If they can start pushing that vision alongside you, it goes a lot faster. And, you know, we're now at this point where there's still a lot of, you know, as we're growing, we've been growing quickly. Uh, there's a lot of things to figure out, uh, but I've got a I've got a good enough uh, group of people at the company that can take these problems, I guess, and figure out how to problem solve so that we can move faster. So it's a it's iterative. It's not overnight. Got to keep it simple. 
Um, and you, you have to be very, you have to be unwavering, uh, in, in the process as the leader so that I think people really buy in and commit to it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, are you guys still uh, private equity backed? We are. Yep. Okay. So how did you balance culturally and as a CEO, the, Hey, transformation takes multiple years and we're really like shifting this big boat alongside using a dynamic technology that needs quasi rapid adoption. It's kind of this interesting parallel because you have to go fast, but you also have to go slow. How did you manage that culturally and how did you manage that in your head? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, probably not as well as I should have. <laughs> answer. You're right. In some sense, we were moving fast and in other areas, it was glacially slow. And so where we, you know, where we really tried to focus was you know, like specifically around our product, uh, we had this product. It had been around a while. Um, it had been a little bit of a kind of the uh, the forgotten child in the corner, if you will, here at the company. And that's and we wanted to take this product and make it our main primary focus. And so we, you know, had to spend a lot of time initially just you know adding features, adding capability, getting this thing kind of enterprise grade, um, and make it realize, you know, make it really kind of the, the the shining star, if you will, of the organization. Only until we did that could we really build a, a good go-to-market engine around it. And so one thing that was hard was wanting to move fast, but knowing that, hey, as soon as I start pumping dollars into sales and marketing, if I don't have really strong product market fit with my current product, it's going to be highly inefficient and unsuccessful. And so we, you know, we went, and I, again, I didn't do this perfectly. Um, uh, I think there were times that we went out and sold it and it was a bad solution. It was a bad customer. It was not our not our ICP. And we thought, hey, let's just try this. Mm. Um, and we probably didn't have right product market fit. And we, you know, we learned from it. And so, you know, it wasn't really until about a year ago that we were able to turn on the, I guess, the turbo boosters and say, okay, we've got good product market fit. We know who we're selling to. We know the problems we're solving. We know how to implement this. And uh, let's go. And so now we're trying to, I think now we're trying to kind of keep up as an organization with our revenue to making sure that we, you know, we give every customer a great experience and we don't, we don't drop any balls. Cool. Well, one of the things that you had said earlier, and I knocked on one, you're like, hey, I've seen everything. I'm like, well, <laughs> just wait. Uh, because yeah. what I heard is like, yes, you had to go through that. Like, uh, I think a situation that most CEOs won't unless you're kind of a turnaround CEO. And then I'm not saying that the business was in turnaround situation, but you're coming in you're trying to move it around. Now that you've got a great product, you've got great at product market fit, you've got the right team, the right people, the right communication, the right structure. Now it's, let's put some gas on the fire and, and let's move it forward. So I guess uh, my question is, what do you, without getting kind of too into the business, what do you see as being the things that you need to work on uh, in your leadership, as in what are those next stages of growth and development that you foresee as a CEO? Because you might just be just a couple steps ahead of a couple people. Yeah, I think for me, so for me personally, uh, we are coming out of the phase where I can have my hands in everything. And and that is how we've operated so far. I have, have been a part of most almost every, I mean, every major decision for sure. And many minor decisions, um, you know, everything from marketing collateral to our pricing strategy to, you know, which conferences we're going to attend to hiring, you know, the junior analyst, if you will. Um, I have been very in, involved in that because, you know, I've had that vision of who are we going to be, where are we going? And now we're at this stage, uh, you know, approaching 60 employees where, I've got to delegate that. And so a big thing for me is have I surrounded myself with great leaders and and are those leaders equipped by me to be successful and be autonomous where they need to be so that they can then do that with their next layer of leadership, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's that's probably that's where we are as an organization starting to build out a couple layers of I guess management if you will, which makes me cringe to even say that, but <laughs> you know, for us to really for us to achieve our goals in the next several years, I got to have the guy that's two la la layers below me able to make good decisions for the business and not have to come to his boss or come to me in that situation. Cool. I get that. And I think it'll be again, a, a new learning, but it sounds like you've got a good support structure in place. And, and for our listeners, you know, if you've ever, if you're ever going into a new place, try to surround yourself with people that have been to that place before um, so that you can learn from them. Cause you don't need to kind of learn the hard way every time, but your journey is going to be 
different than the people around you. So don't let them tell you what to do. You have to learn that for yourself. But well, what excites you about the the space, the industry, the technology? What are you looking forward to in, in that realm? Yeah, it's kind of funny. You know, we've been in this AI space now um, for several years. And, you know, the AI that we're using, natural language processing, which is, you know, reading a document, identifying it and extracting the data, that's slightly different than what, um, you know, these generative AI models are like chat GPT. However, the, the, the press exposure from that has been awesome because it's getting everybody to think about how can I use AI in my own business? And we solve really boring back office practical things at these banks, credit unions, and lenders um, that they they know the pain. And I don't think they've ever realized that that AI can come in. And this is not like you're you're taking some high risk um, bleeding edge technology. Um, and, and so that's been a really exciting thing for us is we're able to go talk to to C level folks at these banks and say, hey, your board has asked you to use AI, and it scares you because you don't even know what that means. Let's go through some really boring, practical places that you can put in AI now. You can get a win. Uh, you can start leveraging the power of it and truly get some business value out of it, some, some of the automation that we bring. Um, and you don't have to necessarily go launch a chat bot on your website that's going to sign people up for a new credit card. Like That's not where you have to start. Yeah, absolutely. It's what I, what I was just thinking about as I was processing through that. It's like, if I think of the selling framework, like product aware, solution aware, problem aware, and then I have a, see these people that are like, okay, we need to use AI, but there's a disconnect between it. There's like AI and the use case for AI and in kind of call it banking situations, especially in those type of industries, we talk about glacially slow. It's the way we've always done things. Hell, three years ago, four years ago, you couldn't even get a DocuSign sent over for a mortgage. You had to wet signature. Now you're asking people to use artificial intelligence or robots to scan something for you to cut down your compliance time by like 90%. I don't know what it is, but it's probably pretty close. Yeah. And, and so you have these different generational people who have been used to doing it a certain way. There's tools which are unknown. And then you also have like industry forces, which are like, Hey, how can we maximize profit um, to, to the most extent? And then the other kind of thing I thought about was call it five, seven years ago, they talked about robots coming and and taking away menial labor. But I don't think people thought about robots in the sense of technology robots. I think they thought like this kind of robot. And so it's interesting how your organization, other organization disrupting payments, disrupting labor, disrupting just major industries. So I wish you luck, man. That sounds like a very cool place to be. So um, uh, I guess I should probably ask you a question. Um, well, I was going to say, I guess just ripping <laughs> off that, Anthony, one thing that one thing that we get asked a lot uh, it's kind of an assumption that's made is that, you know, AI is going to come and replace jobs, kill off jobs. And I think that's overblown, even like our AI, right? If you put us in, in theory, you need less people reviewing documents, checking data, doing ma ma you know manual data entry. But what we see is that these banks really use this AI as almost a productivity enhancer for their existing staff. And now those folks can be a lot more productive in their day working on higher value tasks, um, handling kind of more complex issues. Uh, and, and so there's kind of this, uh, I think there's this false narrative sometimes around AI that it's just, we're in the zero sum game. And if AI wins, you know, people or labor lose, I think what's really going to happen is you're going to push forward this frontier of productivity and allow, you know, the staff that do exist in an organization to do a lot more and that organization then can push forward as well. So it's going to be, I think, a big enabling tool, uh, and there's a bit of fear mongering going on around it that I think is overblown. And like as someone who's been in this space and has been putting this stuff in for years now, it just like there's very few situations where we've actually come in and they've just fired like half the team. A lot of times they don't even have the staff that they need in the first place. They've had struggle hiring. And so now they don't even have to go try to backfill those roles or they reallocate folks to do the higher purpose stuff. And that's what's really exciting about AI in general. And I think is if you're a leader and you're you're probably sitting there even like I am in my own business thinking about, okay, how do we use AI internally to run the business more efficiently? I wouldn't think of it as like a, how do I just, how do I just maybe cut cost or, or get reduced staff? It's more about how do I make my current staff as tw twice as productive um, and, 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 you know, allow them to do things that they can't do today. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think it'll be an interesting, interesting and evolving space, even if you are on the technological cutting edge, bleeding edge, which I am certainly not. But the, the key word that I want to bring up that you had shared was AI enabled. And I know people hear it and they hear it from different places and they'll hear it different ways. But I think of like Iron Man, stupid example, but here we are because yeah. Iron Man's going off and doing his thing. And then he asked Jarvis, his AI to basically solve something quickly while he's doing something else. So AI is your co-pilot to support you while you're doing all of those things. So that as a call it a bank, you spend more time with customers. AI cannot do that. Spend time supporting your colleagues, supporting doing complex problems, and you can delegate optimize the low value stuff within a team. And I think you hit it on the head. People are already short staffed. And so it's really about their short staff You doing low value stuff. How can you use tools like that to support people in any organization doing the high yeah. value stuff? Uh, Will, just as we finish up here, uh, what would you recommend to our leaders as they are looking at, uh, you know, whether that's AI, implementing uh, new technologies or whether that's just in leadership, uh, taking on a new role and, and kind of jumping in head first, what would you recommend to them as we finish up? Oh man, that's a good question. We could do a whole nother podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I think like if you're a new leader, well, I'll answer your AI first quickly. Um, there's a lot of options out there. Uh, think about what sort of problem you need to solve and then, and then go find the solution to the problem. Don't, don't go find a cool tool and then try to fit it in the org. That's kind of my, my, my quick add on that. If you're a new leader, I would spend a little bit of time building your own identity as a leader. And, you know, if you've been an individual contributor before and now you're a leader and you're responsible for people, there's a whole new set of skills that you're going to be exercising um, around helping others prioritize certain initiatives. Um, you may be called on to hire folks or to set strategy. Um, you're certainly in a role where you're expected to be building culture. And if you don't even know what that culture is that you're building, like that would be a good place to start. Like, you know, this organization I'm in, I'm now a leader, even if it's just of three people, what are the cultural values we have at the organization? And then how, you know, as a leader, am I embodying those so that I can provide um, kind of operating leverage to the people below me so they can be super, super uh, um, successful in their roles. And so spend some time, you know, you can do that by listening to podcasts, uh, reading leadership books. Uh, there's a lot to do, but but I think you need to spend some time and say, okay, who am I going to be as a leader? What are my core values? How am I going to manage? Um, how am I going to communicate with my team? Uh, what are they going to, what do I want them to expect of me? And I think that'll allow you to be a lot more intentional and get better results out of the folks that you're, that you're leading. That's awesome. I know you've been at this for four years, but spoken like a true veteran will. So I just appreciate you sharing today. Super fun conversation. Uh, I really appreciate you just taking the time. And I'm super excited to see, uh, you know, what your company comes up with in the future. Uh, where can people connect with you? Where can they learn about Encapture? And uh, we'll, let's say goodbye for today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Encapture.com is our site. You can hit me up on LinkedIn, Will Robinson. And, uh, you know, you can't miss the red hair. So if you're wondering if you found me, if it's a redhead, it's probably me. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate it, Anthony. Thanks so much for having me today. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Folks, well, one of the things I'm taking away from, from Will sharing is, you know, creating the identity that you want, both identity as a CEO, but identity as a company and really charting that future, making sure that you have the right people at the table, making sure the people see the vision, that you've got that communication, and then also using the tools at your disposal to be able to make that change, whether it's AI, whether it's something else, you know, being able to make that future a reality, both in terms of an individual, as an individual leader, or as an organization is critical. So a uh, lot of great lessons here. I really appreciate you watching. I appreciate you listening. We'll thank you again for being our guest today. Uh, this has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My name's Anthony Taylor. I hope everybody has a lovely day, lovely weekend, lovely month, lovely year. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider giving us a review. We appreciate you listening and following along. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And as Anthony says, until next time.